This training session is designed for staff working on behalf of NECOS to help them better understand what confidential information is and the importance of protecting it and how to appropriately manage risk to this information. The objectives of the training today is to provide some specific training based on the role that you carry out for NECOS in line with the information governance training procedure. And it's very much trying to focus on the areas that are relevant to NECOS and the information that they handle. So today's session will help you understand what confidential data you handle and the importance of handling that effectively. To understand a little bit more about the management of risk in relation to this information and also to talk through the project information risk assessment process that NEQOS has implemented to help you understand risks in relation to your projects. And the ultimate aim of this is to prevent incidents and kind of breaches of confidential information. We'll also be giving you some further guidance on where to get further help. So confidential information, what is it? There are a number of terms that are used now in relation to information and data and confidential information. Um, people might say it's identifiable, they might say it's confidential. There's personal and sensitive data, which again are different types of confidential data. And then there may be discussions around, well, what is and what isn't confidential information? So is aggregate information confidential? Does it have to be personal level? What if it's pseudonymized? So there's lots of different terms out there that can make it quite confusing to understand what confidential informa information is and understand why and what you might handle in terms of confidential information. So I'm just going to talk through some of that in terms of in what situations uh, data and information might be confidential or not. Or are there situations where some types of information may be confidential in some situations but not in others? There are a number of different examples of types of information on this slide, um, which we're going to discuss in terms of whether they're confidential or not. So we're just going to go around there. So the first one we have is terminations in under 16 in local authority area. Clearly, um, terminations or abortion statistics can be very sensitive information and need to be protected. However, if we're talking about numbers of terminations, it's maybe to be dependent on how many there were in that local authority area. So in a, quite a large local authority area, you might find that there's quite a number um, of terminations in under 16s. And in that case, it may be very difficult or, or impossible to link that specific information back to an individual. And we'll talk a little bit more about small numbers in a minute. IMT security policy. Most policy documents for an organisation are corporate documents, and as such, they're public information, so would not be confidential. The only situation we may need to consider in relation to IMT security is whether it includes any detailed security information which could put the organisation at risk, but the majority of IMT security policies wouldn't include that level of information. The one down the bottom here is a quote from confidential inter interview in a report and the clue here is in the kind of um, the description really about it being a confidential interview. So if information is provided in a situation of confidence then there'll be a duty to protect that information. So it may be that you carry out an interview with a member of staff or a patient and you tell them that there'll be nothing that can be identified back to them will be included in any kind of future reports. So if there's any chance that that information could be matched to that individual by what they're saying in that quote, then you would need to consider that confidential. Back up to the top now on the right, we have county level readmissions by trust. Now, as you can imagine, there's going to be a large number of readmissions in, for any particular trust at a county level. So it's likely that this would not be confidential information because the numbers would be too big to be able to identify an individual. Patient level HES data is quite a specific type of information. Um, the data that's provided in HES 
it's often not actually uniquely identified in terms of name and address and that kind of information, but it will still potentially be identifiable because it includes a combination of information that may between them be able to identify an individual or be able to match with some other information that you might have in your possession to be able to identify that individual. So there needs to be great care taken with HES data. And there is specific rules about HES and the numbers of um, that you can release in relation to HES data. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Staff appraisal record. So in the NHS, there's a lot about protecting patient information, but it's not just about patient information. It's about any individual level um, data. So that will be personal data about staff as well. And a staff appraisal is clearly a confidential um, interview between the manager and the staff member, and so should be kept confidential. And the last one, perhaps one of the more obvious ones, is Mr Smith's social care record. So clearly that's very personal information and potentially sensitive information about Mr Smith in his social care records, which would have been provided in the situation of confidence, so should be kept confidential. So in terms of considering whether something is confidential, there might be different categories um, that might make it confidential. So we've talked a lot there about personal information. So if we can identify that to an individual, whether that be a staff member, a patient or a carer, it would be likely to be confidential information. And that's not necessarily about name data. So it might be that even aggregate data, if it's very small numbers, or perhaps line level data out of heads or something like that, that could still potentially be linked to an individual and in which case we would need to class as confidential information. But there are other areas of confidential information which aren't just about personal information. And it might be that there's commercially sensitive information in contracts that need to be protected. There might be letters from legal firms that we might need to protect. And there might be situations where sharing of information might be security risk. So that might be about passwords for systems or other IT security related information. There's also um, something about the context in which that information is given. So if information is given in a situation of confidentiality and the often quoted example would be the patient clinician um, relationship, um, then clearly we have a duty of confidence to that information. But if it's very much public information, that information is already in the public domain, then it would not be as confidential. So I'm now going to talk a little bit. We mentioned it before about small numbers and when small numbers might be considered to be confidential information. In 2011, the Department of Health lost a court battle to stop the release of abortion statistics. The case was between the Department of Health and the Pro-Life Alliance over the release of small numbers in relation to late abortions. The Department of Health position was that numbers less than 10 should not be released due to the potential for either identifying the individual who had the abortion or potentially the clinicians involved in the abortion. However, the High Court overruled this stating that there was no more chance of re-identifying individuals where the count was less than 10 than when they were over 10. So this led to quite a change in thinking about managing small numbers because the practice had previously been not to release aggregate data under a certain number. But what they were saying now was that you need to consider the risk of re-identification. And the Information Commissioner's Office released guidance on this through their anonymisation code of practice, which helped people think through what the likelihood was of re-identification in different situations. And it quoted in there the recital 26 of the European Data Protection Directive, which said that the principles of protection should not apply to data rendered anonymous in such a way that the data subject is no longer identifiable. So it's very much saying that you need to make the data anonymous by making sure you cannot identify the individual from that data. And related to this, they talked about the motivated intruder test. So this was a way of trying to say, given the information I've got, how likely is it that that information will be re-identified? So they talked about the motivated intruder. If they had a motivated intruder who wanted to try and work out from the information they had who an individual was, 
how would they go about that really? So they were talked about someone who starts without any prior knowledge but wants to identify the individual. And they presume that person to be reasonably competent, have access to resources such as the internet, libraries and all public documents and may employ investigative techniques such as making inquiries of people who may have additional knowledge um, or advertising with any information to come forward. Um, so it'd be about would that individual, if they were motivated, be able to identify the individual from the data or from the aggregate data. And certainly some data will be more attractive to a motivated intruder than others, so it may, may make them more motivated. So if there's information that may provide financial gain, um, may be embarrassing to others, might be useful for political purposes, or maybe, you know, curiosity value if there's um, a local celebrity perhaps that's been admitted to hospital, certainly that's going to be an interest to the local press and things like that. So it's about, you know, if you were that motivated intruder, how likely is it that you'd be able to identify that information, um, that individual from that information? So we just discussed whether or not data is releasable based on the risk of re-identification. But the hospital episode statistics, or HES data, has some specific rules set out by the Health and Social Care Information Centre about what can and cannot be released. In particular, it highlights some key areas. It identifies small numbers as being the numbers 1 to 5, and the situations in which it may or may not be appropriate to publish these. It talks about geographical areas and how it would be okay to release numbers one to five in larger areas, such as nationally or for government or NHS regions, but not in small areas such as CCGs, local authorities, wards, postcode districts or organisational level, as this may lead to the identification of individual patients or clinicians. It states that when suppressing numbers, you do not need to suppress zeros, but you may need to suppress at least the next smallest cell in the table to avoid calculation of the suppressed values from the totals provided. It also clarifies that these counts might not necessarily be about individuals. For instance, it could relate to episodes, admissions or bed days, but they should still be treated in the same way. More stringent criteria are also in place for specific sensitive diagnoses. Figures on certain diagnoses and surgical procedures should not be published, and the most up-to-date lists of these can be found in the HES protocol. It's also worth noting that although the HES data only includes anonymised consultant GP and referrer data, care should still be taken with this data where other aspects of the analysis could potentially re-identify them. There may also be other ways that the data could be presented to avoid any chance of individuals being identified, and it's worth reviewing the HES protocol and its small numbers schedule routinely to ensure you're fully aware of your responsibilities in this area. So we've talked about confidential information in terms of what it is. We've talked about small numbers and the situations where that might be considered as confidential. What we haven't really talked about is why we might want to protect confidential information. So I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Clearly, um, that data and that information is about individuals, and usually that information has been provided in a situation of confidence. So that might be a patient, that might be a staff member, but we have a duty to protect that information because, as you can imagine, it would be very distressing for those individuals if their information was shared with the wrong people, was lost, and we would have a duty to inform them if that happened. So we need to protect them. We also need to protect you as um, members of staff or organisations working with the EQOS. Um, for staff members involved in an information breach, it can be a really difficult thing to have to go through because you have to go through the whole incident management process. And in the majority of cases, people are doing their best to protect confidential information as best as they can. So we're trying to avoid that happening. Also, potentially for third parties, it may lead to breach of contract. So it's about making sure we give people the appropriate knowledge and skills so that they don't end up in that situation. Um, because clearly, if it's a breach of local policy, there's potential for disciplinary processes um, and contractual situations around third parties as well. In terms of the organisation as well, 
if there's a large breach of data or there's a, a situation where a specific individual's information is breached and that might end up in, on the press, in the press or on the internet, it can lead to a real lack of confidence in the organisation and also a risk of a fine for that organisation. They could be prosecuted under the Debt Protection Act and people, um, lots of NHS organisations have been fined for not um, adhering to the Debt Protection Act. And also as a whole, when there are large scale kind of breaches and incidents, that can have an overall impact on you know, the public trust in the NHS overall and with public organisations and about the way we handle their information and may make them less likely to want to share their information with us in future. So I think it's important just to consider you know, the reasons why we are trying to protect confidential information. So we've now talked about what confidential information is and the importance of protecting confidential information. So now I'm going to talk some more about managing risk to that information. And in terms of trying to manage risk more effectively, the things we're trying to avoid is any things that impact on the confidentiality, the integrity or the availability of confidential information. And there may be a number of threats to information and there might be vulnerabilities in the way we manage information that makes them more likely to be affected by these threats. And we then need to consider things like how likely is it that risks are going to happen and what's the ultimate impact of that happening. So just to describe confidentiality, integrity and availability in a little bit more detail. So we're trying to make sure that access to confidential information is confined to those with the appropriate authority. So those people who have a right to be able to access that information and use that information. We want to protect the integrity of that data or information to make sure it's complete and accurate uh, with all systems, assets and networks operating the way they should. And we also want to look at the availability of that information. So we want information to be available and delivered to the right person at the time when it's needed. So NECROS have developed a project information risk assessment form. And this is specifically so that people working on projects can help think through what might be the information risks relating to that project. And this is just a kind of screenshot of this information risk assessment form. And I'm now going to talk you through some of the different areas in that. So the key areas of the information risk assessment form is to detail very much the project information, who it's to be shared with and how that's going to happen. To make sure that we have a firm legal basis for sharing that information and we clearly understand what the purpose is for sharing that information that we've thought through the methods of transfer of that information, any risks and controls we need to apply to that. And thinking through how the information is stored, are there any specific risks in relation to the storage of that information? We'll need to think about retention and disposal. Do we know when we're, how long we're supposed to keep the data for and when we're supposed to get rid of it? And any additional governance measures we might need to put in place. We also might need to think about any further training implications. So everybody who's working on that project, do they understand confidential information well enough to be able to handle that appropriately? So I'm going to talk you through to start with the legal basis of sharing information and processing information. So in data protection under the Data Protection Act 1998, um, there may be different types of information we're dealing with. So information may be anonymous, in which case it can't be linked to an individual, and in which case it wouldn't be covered under the Data Protection Act. But then there's also confidential data that will be covered under the Data Protection Act, and this is information related to individuals, which may be either personal information, or it may be more sensitive information, which is a category of personal information, which we'll talk about in a minute. And what we need to ensure we have in place if we are processing confidential information, personal information and sensitive information, is that we have a fair and lawful basis for doing that. And also that processing meets a number or one of a number of conditions for processing, which again, we'll go into in more detail. So just define what we mean by personal and sensitive data. Personal data is relating to a living individual who can be identified from those data or from those data and other information which comes in the, into the possession of 
or is likely to come into the possession of the data controller. And we talked through earlier in this training session about the different circumstances and the different types of information which might be personal or not. Sensitive data is a specific form of personal data which consists of information of which might be to do with somebody's racial or ethnic origin, their political opinion, their religious or similar beliefs, their trade union membership, physical or mental health, so clearly in the NHS, that's quite a key one, sexual life, commission of alleged or alleged commission of offences and any proceedings relating to those. So sensitive information is very much a category of personal information on its own and is treated quite differently under the Data Protection Act due to its level of sensitivity. So we talked before about um, information processing and information sharing needing to be fair and lawful. So basically all that means is that we need a lawful grounds for collecting and using the personal data. So we don't want collecting or processing that data to break any laws. And in the NHS, we need to make sure that we have a, um, a statutory right to be able to process that information. So we need to make sure that the reasons we're processing that information, that it comes under one of the functions of our organisation. And there's another number of other laws we've mentioned on there that we might need to consider as well. Um, we also need to make sure that it's fair so that it's not used in a way that may have unjustified adverse effects on individuals. And what's really important is we need to be really transparent about the way we use people's personal information. And one of the ways we do that, there's a couple of ways we might do that. One is we provide materials to people to say, this is how we're going to be processing your information. Um, or we may actually try and gain explicit consent from people and give them detailed information to be able to make that informed explicit consent. But basically, information should be handled in a way that individuals would reasonably expect if it's their information. And that might be because we've informed them that this is how we use your information, so there's no surprises really. Uh, so basically, we need to be fair and lawful, not to do anything unlawful with the data. And the next thing we talked about was once we're OK about it being fair and lawful and we're comfortable with that, we th then need some condition for processing that information. Now, that will be dependent on whether it's personal information or sensitive information. So there's a number of um, areas in Schedule 2 of the Data Protection Act that you may would have to meet one of to be able to process personal data. And there's a number of reasons there, and we're not going to go into all of them. But what can be quite key is consent in this and gaining consent for the processing of that personal data can be um, a quite a key way of managing that information more effectively and lawfully. And the, we have two different types of consent here. So we have uh, a general consent that they talk about in under personal information and they have explicit consent under sensitive information. And explicit consent is where we very much have had that conversation with the individual and they've been provided with appropriate information so they're very much informed of how their personal data will be used. And then we have some kind of record that they have consented to that. So that might be kind of a signed form that um, they've been talked through with and then they've signed to say they're happy for that information to be um, shared or processed for that specific project. Um, consent for personal information is a bit um, vaguer in some ways in that in some situations that that consent can be implied. So for medical um, treatment, it might be that the GP implies that you're happy for your information to be shared with the hospital um, because you're coming in to, to, to see um, that GP or medical professional. And that's very much about the no surprises that people would expect that information to be shared in that way. But if it's sensitive information, which medical information comes under, so if it's anything about people's health um, or social care and things like that, even potentially, um, then you're going to be looking at sensitive information. So you may need to look at explicit consent. But there are, again, a lots of other kind of situations where it may be appropriate to share um, without consent. Um, and there's there's a number of things there and there's more detail will be provided under the Data Protection Act and I'll provide you some further sources of information at the end of this session.
So I'd just like to talk to you briefly now about transferring confidential information and some of the risks associated with that. So we've included a few examples here. Um, one potential risk for transferring information might be sending personal confidential information by insecure email. So that's some kind of um, email transfer where we know that the information may not be secure en route. It might be intercepted in some way. There may be no in encryption applied to that transfer. Um, but we do know that there's certain methods of transferring information by email which are secure, such as NHS mail to another NHS mail address. Um, the NHS also have a secure file transfer service, which allows you to transfer some bigger files um, up to one gigabyte. And there may be methods of encryption you can put in place to make sure the email is secure. But we'll talk again about that in a second. The other is sharing information over the Internet. There may be situations where that can be done effectively, but you must seek guidance from the IT, desk, um, IT service desk for that um, to make sure you are using an approved method of sharing information. So a lot of um, NHS organisations um, do not authorise the use of Dropbox. Um, certainly, there'll be an issue around sharing information potentially through social media. Um, and there may be other ways you may store or share information on the internet. There's things like SkyDrive and OneDrive and all of these areas, really. And it's really just about making sure that your IT service, your information governance service that you're dealing with um, are happy with those um, methods. The other issue you may find is around transferring information using portable media. So you might have something on a memory stick or a CD, and it's about making sure that that information is encrypted so that should that get lost or fall into the wrong hands, that would be very difficult to access. And linked to that is obviously about password security. So encryption's fine, um, but if, you, if the password is kind of stuck on the memory stick, which allows you to kind of get through that encryption, then, then that's not going to be helpful. There may still be information, confidential information that's being sent by post or in person. Again, it's just making sure you have all the appropriate controls in there. So things being appropriately packaged, sent by special delivery, so you know that there uh, can be signed for um, and you know you can track that item. Um, and just, you know, common sense things like, you know, if you have to take things in person, not leaving things on display in cars and those kind of things. So it's really just thinking through some of the obvious potential risks around transferring information and making sure, sure that's done appropriately and also seeking help um, from IT or information governance if you're not sure about that. This is just um, a slide showing you where, uh, where you can transfer personal information securely via email. And as we talked about before, we talked about NHS Net and using NHS mail addresses. But there are also other secure government, government networks that you can send NHS mail to. Um, and there's some examples included there, such as the gsi.gov.uk, um, some of the police networks. And also, um, if you're sending information on the same um, network between, for instance, an NTW and an NTW account. Um, but I think you just need to be very careful. If you're not sure, then seek further guidance and help on that. So I'd like to tell you a bit more now about the secure file transfer service that I mentioned earlier. And basically, the secure file transfer, or the SFT, is a web service set up by the Health and Social Care Information Centre to securely transfer larger files. So currently, we can send information securely and encrypted from one NHS mail account to another um, and in the ways I showed you previously. But that's limited by the size of file you can attach to that. Um, and you can only attach files up to 20 megabytes. So this service allows files between 20 megabytes and one gigabyte to be sent securely in an encrypted way. So to be able to use the service, um, each person using it must be on N3. Um, they must have their own NHS mail account and they also need to register with the service. So when they register with the service, they'll be provided with a pin which will allow them to use that in the future. So if you'd like to be able to use the service, um, the website is provided there. 
and that will allow you to go in and get further information also to register and to use that um, and it will just allow you then to be able to securely transfer that information um, in ways that minimizes the risk to that data so it's worth considering so again there's another potential area of risk might be storage of that information so in some situations, the confidential or personal information will be sitting on secure servers in an NHS organisation, very, very much protected. But there might be situations where that information might need to be handled differently. People might need to be working in a home environment. Um, that information might need to be shared with third parties. And you need to make sure that you have appropriate arrangements in place for that, whether that be contractual or kind of technical arrangements to make sure that storage is secure for that information. You need to think a little about where that information is being stored. So if that information is being stored in another country, um, so an organization might use a third party in America to store that information or in India or somewhere, then you need to just consider um, the potential risks of that because there'll be outside data protection law. And you also need to think about how long that information needs to be stored for. Um, and if you do have an agreed time where that data or information has to be destroyed, what is the evidence that, that information has been destroyed? Um, or if it's been returned, what's the method of um, returning that information? I'd just like to talk to you now about any additional governance measures you might need to consider when assessing risk in relation to your project. Um, if you're dealing with other organisations and sharing information with other organisations or with potentially third party private organisations, you'll need to consider whether that organisation has been registered under the Data Protection Act. If they're handling personal data, they'll need to do that. For some of the larger organisations, you might want to ensure that they are compliant with the Information Governance Toolkit so that they, then you have the appropriate assurance that they have the right information governance standards in place. You may want to check if they're on the NEQOS framework, which means that they've already kind of gone through the appropriate contractual um, considerations in relation to information governance, and they'll have signed up to the NEQOS information governance agreement. You might also need to consider whether there's any further detailed agreements that need to be established. So, if you're using an organisation to um, carry out some processing on your behalf, um, you may need to implement a data processing agreement. So there's a very clear document um, that sets out um, exactly what information, the way the information is going to be handled, what information is going to be shared, what the responsibilities are for all the parties involved in that data processing. So that would be if somebody is specifically doing some processing on your behalf. But if you're working across a number of organisations on a joint project, you might have a data sharing agreement in place, which again will cover similar types of areas about who is responsible for ensuring the safety and the confidentiality of that information and how that will be done. In the NHS, you may also need to consider whether Coldicott approval will be needed. And if it's about patient information, then Coldicott is definitely a factor you need to consider and whether you have Coldicott Guardian sign off. Um, but it'll be important to check with the individual organisation you're working with what their approval processes are around Coldicott and how, they, how, would the, how they'd like to do that, really. You might also need to cover um, training, whether there's any additional training needs specific to this project and around managing uh, confidential information and potentially managing risk. Just to say a little bit more about the cold court approval process, the uh, remit of the cold court guardian is really to oversee all arrangements where confidential patient data will be shared and really ensuring that that sharing only occurs for a justified purpose and meets the cold court principles. And in reality, every health and social care organisation will have a cold court guardian, but they're likely to be supported by the information governance team of that organisation. So if you're dealing with any specific kind of hospital in terms of release of data and sharing of data, then um, the information governance team would be a good starting point in trying to identify whether cold cut approval is needed or not for whatever you're trying to do.
So cold to cut approval is likely to be needed for all new routine data flows and also ad hoc requests for release of personal information. So if you're doing a specific project and you're trying to ascertain whether cold to cut approval may be needed, some aspects for consideration may be is whether you're actually asking for personal information and that kind of goes back to all the things we've already said on this and what in terms of what is the personal information and what isn't. Um, and then if you do have to um, go through that cold cop approval process, you'll need to be um, justifying that request against um, all the cold cop principles and making sure that you have a clear legal basis for um, sharing and, and needing that information. But the best thing to do really is to ensure that you're meeting any specific trust procedures in this area is to agree with that local information governance lead within that organisation. Um, what are the methods for gaining cold cut approval or even just to have that discussion about whether cold cut approval is going to be needed from that organisation is usually the best way of trying to understand fully what needs to be done. Just a brief slide there, just talking about data control and the data processors. So this is just really to define in more detail what we mean by that. The data controller under the Data Protection Act is a person who determines the purposes for which and the manner in which any personal data are to be processed. So they're the ones who are making the decisions about how that data will be handled. The data processor would be any person that's just processing the data on behalf of the data controller. So they'd be doing that under instruction from the data controller. So when we talked about data processing agreements before, if somebody's just carrying out that work on, under your instructions with that information, then it's likely that they're a data processor and you'd need a data processing agreement with them. But if it's a number of data controllers working together, you're more likely to use the data sharing agreement for that. Okay, so I'd just like to just show you now how the project information risk assessment might be used. We've talked through all those different aspects of the information risk assessment and the different questions that come under there. So here's just an example scenario which you might come across. You might then apply your information risk assessment form to. So I'm just going to give you a minute to read that. So in terms of the questions on the project information risk assessment form and relate to this scenario, in terms of information to be shared, while well, it was staff interviews covering confidential information on their views, it would be collected within the staff base and shared between the project officer and external consultant via email. So that's looking at what the information was, who is accessing it and how it's going to be shared. In terms of the purpose and legal basis, while well, the purpose was to identify aspects of care, and other areas that may impact on readmissions. So for the legal basis, clearly it needs to be fair and lawful. So one of the ways of doing that, although it hasn't said that this will happen, it would be to actually gain explicit consent from those individuals involved in the interviews. So that you then make sure they knew exactly how their information was going to be used and they would have signed to say that they've consented to that process. In terms of methods of transfer and potential risks and controls there, it says that the information is to be shared via email, but it's unclear if that's between two secure emails or not. So that would be one of the things to look at. We know that the information is going to be held on a secure and equal system. So from a storage point of view, that's a positive thing, but it's not really clear what controls might be in place on the external consultant system. So are they using an equals laptop that's encrypted? Do they have remote access directly into an equal system so that there's information never sitting on any kind of personal equipment of that external consultant? So you need to consider those aspects as well. And then in terms of retention and disposal, 
Um, there's nothing in here really that tells us how long any individual involved in that project is going to keep that information. And do we know whether that's been agreed with the trusts involved in the project, with the participants? We need to check if it was in line with the trust retention schedule. I would need to think through how it can be disposed of or deleted at the end of the uh, retention time scale, both from the trust system, from the consultant system, and what evidence would we have that that had been done? In terms of additional governance, the we might need to check if the external consultant has signed up to the appropriate IG agreement, such as the NEQOS IG agreement through the framework. Is there a data processing agreement in place for NEQOS? And also, are those external staff registered under the Data Protection Act? In terms of need for further training, there may be need for additional training for the internal or external staff uh, in terms of management of confidential, confidential information if we're not sure that they have that training already. And in terms of any other risks in relation to that, well, potentially one of them could be publication of that information to the NEQOS website. Has it been appropriately anonymised before it's actually published? So you can see how these questions help you just think through some of the potential risks that might be there in the project and how you may then try and control those risks. So what we've tried to cover today is to help you understand what confidential information you handle and the importance of protecting that, to think about how that information is processed at the moment um, and any potential risk to that. So we've talked about how information is stored, how it's transferred and shared, how information is disposed of when it needs to be, and how we use the project information risk assessment form to consider some of the potential risks to information being used within projects. What's really key, I think, is if you do have any concerns and issues, then it would be best to report those so that we can try and make things better and improve the way we manage information. And if you have any doubts in terms of how confidential information should be handled, then we do. there is an information governance lead in place in NECOS who can help with that. If you do have further queries on this or would like some further guidance, the Information Commissioner's Office has a lot of detailed information on the Data Protection Act and how to apply that to protect confidential information. This is also reflected in Trust Policy and Procedure, which you'll find in their confidentiality and IT security policies. And also, if you have any queries in relation to this or any other areas around confidential information, you can contact the New Cross Information Governance Lead, who is Valerie Corris, and her email is provided there below. So thanks very much for your time today, and I hope you found that helpful.